Wallsend High Street last New Year's Eve. The last few minutes in the life of Tyneside hardman Viv Graham. It's six o'clock in the evening, but he's already been celebrating. Viv Graham's on his way home to change, ready for the night ahead. But he won't be seeing the New Year in. His killers are waiting. They've smashed the driver's window of his Ford Cosworth to make sure he pauses outside the car. Though he managed to crawl back onto the high street, his life is ebbing away. He died four hours later in hospital. But for some on Tyneside that night, Viv Graham's murder added sparkle to New Year's Eve. The drug gangs were celebrated. They'd been barred from dealing in the pubs and clubs looked after by Viv Graham. Now the bars were unprotected, giving the pushers the chance to force their way into new markets. But the landlords amongst his friends in Wall's End and Biker were deeply shocked by his murder, which was already creating a tense atmosphere in Tyneside's popular clubs and pubs. There wasn't a bread knife big enough to cut it. Catastrophic. I mean, obviously, there were, uh, obviously New Year's Eve would revel as didn't know about it. There was a lot of strangers from the surrounding areas coming in to drink. They didn't know about it. But certainly, everybody who lived in the Walls End area, anybody who stayed out, um, which again was about 50% of the people stayed out. The other 50% were just devastated and just went home. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody loved them. You know, I haven't. Since Viv Graham's death, the landlords believe there's a power vacuum which may be filled by anyone from local troublemakers to root the drug pushers. It's the quiet before the storm. I don't think it's just, I don't think it's the pubs. I think it's just general people as well, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of people who don't feel safe because he's not here. Mm -hmm. well, since Viv Graham's death, in the Wall's End area, we have had specific approaches to, to some publicans, not many, but, but, but the some. And some of those publicans have been threatened with violence. Um, knives have been produced on one occasion, and a gun was produced on another occasion. So the people you're talking about are sort of, uh, would be Viv Graham's successors? Some of them would be. Um, there's different types of protection. There's been a number of different types of, of approach. One is that, yes, I, I, I'll come and do the business for you and take the place of Viv Graham or try to take the place of Viv Graham. The second one, and, and the far more dangerous one, is Viv Graham's not here, um, I'm here, give me money, or else we're gonna destroy your premises and damage yourself. Though Viv Graham clearly made deadly enemies in the end, he also made a lot of friends. His wife, Anna, received many cards of condolence. Despite his trade, he was widely known as an affectionate family man. This is the image they'll remember. Anna and Viv recorded on video at a school sports day and clearly enjoying every minute of it. From his youth, Viv Graham was a keen boxer and bodybuilder. Strength became his fortune. His services soon in demand at popular Tyneside pubs and clubs. He wasn't, to be fair, the sort of uh, guy who would go to a licensed premises and ask for protection money or else he would come back and smash up the premises. And that wasn't his game at all. He would provide a service to managers on a voluntary basis that if they had trouble, rather than come to the police, or if the police couldn't do a good enough job for them, Viv Graham would step in and sort it out. He would control the doors of, of clubs, of, of uh, nightclubs, for instance, in, in some of the Newcastle area. And part of his duties he took on, so to speak, would be to stop certain factions selling drugs in these premises. If the landlords needed his services, Viv Graham badly needed their money. A few weeks before he died, he promised his wife Anna he'd give up gambling. Detectives investigating his murder 
have traced gambling losses for the past year alone of £100,000. He was badly in debt and his car was about to be repossessed. That despite an income of around a quarter of a million pounds a year from his business. Much of it arranged through his brother-in-law, Peter Connolly. We found out that there was a lot of that pubs getting grief, trouble, whatever you could call it, in the Wolves End area, Baker area, and uh, it was there to sort it. And most people used to phone me and ask us if I'd uh, go and sort it, like get in touch with Viv. And I, I used to, and uh, I'd take them along as a friendly, have a pint, see what he thought and see what was the best way to, to sort the trouble out, you know, and that was the way I did it. I was having a bit of trouble with a, with a fella in the bar, and uh, he's, he's threatening. He was a big fella, I, I couldn't handle him. The same fella used to send ambulances, fire brigades, police, saying there was bombs in the place. He actually sent a scrap wagon one day, saying there's an old old bang outside the, outside the bar. Can you pick it up for us? It was a brand new, brand new motor. That's how daft the fella was. So I found... Uh, I phoned my mate, Peter, Peter Conley, and uh, he said he'd be down, so he, when he came down, he fed his bed. He asked what was wrong, I told him. He says, I'll have a well and say that there's no more trouble. He went straight to see the fellow, he knew where he would be, had a word with him, and to this day I've never ever seen him. So you hired Viv? I hired Viv, he said, oh, what can you afford? 50 quid a day. Yeah, 50 quid. 50 quid a week? Yeah. He had a good business. He had, a, I would say, about four nightclubs, um, five or six big pubs, and he had a little local pub, it was like a little corner, like some high pub in the, the county, and a couple of pubs in Walden. And I mean, there was millions more. I don't know where he looked at. There was quite a few in the town, but I didn't know them all, you see. But uh, just the ones that I knew, which I knew well, he had at all. When you say he took... Uh quite a few quid. It must have been a pretty profitable sort of business. Well, I would average, the ones that I knew, we would be on about £3,000 a week, um, which I thought was a good money. I would say that the clubs would have been about 1000 to 700 The big clubs that really took a lot of money. Um, um, yeah, pubs was normally £50. It depend on the tier. If it was a popular pub and it was turning a lot of money, you'd pay up to 150 to 160 so a very big business, and what did people get in return for that? Well, for one, you got in, you got really to um, to publicise that he wasn't he's in charge of your pub, and if you caused any trouble in that particular pub, that you had the consequences to face. And if if uh, for instance you thought you were a threat and you were going to be a threat to the to other pub, you'd probably get a clip. But if you didn't, then he would just give you a warning. You'd maybe get one warning. Some got two, well, quite a few got two warnings, and then if they continued to work themselves in the pubs, then they would get hit. Not what so hard, a slap. Um, What's a slap? It slaps like a backhand or like that, uh, or the back of the neck, or the top of the head. And if you thought they were like a little bit bigger than that, and, and they were really hardish type of lads, then they would get the punch, which would normally be a sleeper, what we call a sleeper and they'd be lying there, like, sound asleep. And you, you wake up about five minutes later, I wonder what's happened to them. And I think that was the message, and then would go around and tell, oh, I got hit last night. I want to get hit like that again. And then that one would go around, and the job got around that he was probably the best man for the job, you know? But he, he did a good job. He delivered a fairly efficient blow. Yeah. Best I've ever seen. He wasn't a guy who would uh, revert to the use of weapons, which a lot of these people do. Um, he was an extremely powerful man, as you know. He was a trained boxer, and he would sort out the trouble with his, with his fists. Um, so it's that level of violence we're talking about. But the injuries, as a result of that action, at times were severe. He never carried knives, guns, never used a bottle or an ashtray, never really fought dirty, except the one occasion when I see them, they actually used his boot, one, a one-off that was, but that's all. What happened in that incident? Yeah, he obviously got he got jailed for it. Um, it was in a nightclub in Newcastle, and it was just uh, he was in with a wrong click, and, and he was set up. As far as I was concerned, he was set up, and he realised that he was messing with the wrong people, and they were just going to use him. He was doing the dirty work for him.
That incident happened when Viv Graham teamed up with members of a gang from the castle's West End. The gang wanted control over Hobo's nightclub in Bath Lane in Newcastle. The club's now closed, but in 1989 it was thriving using doormen and video cameras as security measures. This recording shows six men arriving at the club door. It's the first time it's been seen on TV. Viv Graham is last in, wearing a white shirt. It's a quarter to two on the morning of Saturday, September the 30th. The gang stride straight past the reception desk. Another camera shows the receptionist running upstairs to warn the manager. The head doorman, 28-year-old Stuart Watson, weighing 17 stone, approaches reception, hands in pocket. Viv Graham attacks him, cheered on by his companions. One shouts orders to the receptionist. Viv Graham now has a pressure point on Stuart Watson's neck, preventing him from defending himself. As the beating goes on, another doorman shows signs of intervening. A punch from one of the gang stops that. Stuart Watson is then dragged out of the camera vision onto the dance floor. The receptionist, in shock, desperately tries to wipe up the blood, then calls the police. The gang departs, led by Viv Graham. They'd been in the club for just three minutes and 41 seconds. As they swagger out, one pauses to tell the manager that it was a private fight. The trial was told that Stuart Watson was punched about 20 times in the face and head by Viv Graham. And then, as he staggered around, covered in blood and semi-conscious, he was attacked by other members of the gang. Despite the beating he took, Stuart Watson refused to give evidence. Viv Graham was jailed for three years, four of the gang for two and a half years, and the fifth man for four months. When he got out of jail, Viv Graham isn't thought to have worked with this gang again. But his protection services were even more in demand among landlords and club owners as the world of organized crime based on the drug trade expanded rapidly in the northeast. The little teams now have come super teams, they're bigger, they're stronger. Uh, they know that nobody can phone them to stop them, you see. Where the one gun before, now they can go anywhere they like, you see. I mean, they're in the clubs now, they're back all, they're in all the nightclubs now, There's nobody's stopping them from getting anywhere. Even your bought all your bouncers now, you're, you're leaving license for just that bouncers, they're all frightened. They just tell, let them in, just let them in, and that's what's happening now in all the nightclubs. They've been told, let them in, and that's where it's working. You've got, their, you've got your three squads, or four squads, like I said, and the four of them all hate each other anyway. They're all cutting each other's throats. So what you probably have is more violence between them at the end of the day. They're all in a fight with each other. They're all trying to be top dogs, the number one seller. They want to be the, the main people up in the North East. They want medals for us, and... Um, and as far as calling, they want the whole lot. We are aware of, of certain godfathers, if you like, uh, who are, have a, a family network which is quite extensive uh, in the marriage, long association, where the respected members of the, the older members of the family uh, exert a degree of control. And as they pass through the, the stage where they can exert that control, the younger members come in and take responsibility. And are there the sort of people who are perhaps uh, living fairly affluent lifestyles, the, the, the Mr. Biggs, as, as fiction would have it? Yes, uh, quite often when we do get into their uh, financial affairs, we, we discover that they have accounts uh, offshore uh, and substantial uh, several hundred thousand pounds worth of, uh, of cash in um, sterling and in foreign currency that they could not have uh, obtained through legitimate means. The gang's money comes from the so-called chemists, the pubs and clubs where the drug dealing goes on. Viv Graham's operation was increasingly resented by the gangs. He was interfering in their lucrative trade. And that's why I think they wanted him out of the road. That's why the, the, it's, it's happened, that's why he was shot. Uh, mostly for the clubs 
club scene, the nightclub scene. That's where it sells in big quantities. And if he's running it, and he doesn't like you, you don't get in, and you didn't sell your drugs. And they wanted them out the road. It's as simple as that. They were stopping them in a big way from earning a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. A great deal of money, according to frightening figures just revealed by the Home Office. This research shows that 80% of 18 to 25 year olds on Tyneside and Wearside have taken illegal drugs. In central Newcastle alone, 100,000 young people gather every weekend, providing a profitable market for every kind of illegal drug. This is probably the most common drug around. It's cannabis resin. It's bought by the dealer for 500 pounds for one of these. This is a soap or nine bar, nine ounces of the drug. The dealer splits it up into nine one-ounce chunks. It's sold for 120 pounds a piece. The profit to the dealer, around 500 pounds a bar. The rave drug ecstasy costs the dealer about two pounds 50 a capsule. The user pays between 10 and 15 pounds. Speed or amphetamine sulfate costs the dealer about two thousand pounds a kilo, depending on the purity. He sells it for 10 pounds a gram, making a profit of 8,000 pounds a kilo. Paper impregnated with LSD or acid costs the user several pounds. The dealer, though, pays only 50 pence each, buying them in sheets of a thousand. And this is heroin, highly addictive and hugely expensive. This is a gram it would sell on the streets for around 120 pounds. But some addicts are on as much as three grams a day. It's been worked out. They'd spend every six months the amount of money they could use instead to buy a new Rolls Royce. And there's only one way to pay for a habit like this. That, of course, is crime. Uh, plenty of encouragement, because some dogs would be a bit shy of feather. A peaceful setting for a day's sport in the countryside. But these men earn their money okay. at night, confronting okay. trouble amid Newcastle's bright lights, working as club bouncers, now officially known as doormen. Actually, For the yeah. drug dealers, the clubs are honeypots, and the men on the door are in the Good ideal enough. situation Good to see a violent trade in Good action. Enough. Thank you. If there's anyone feeling threatened regarding, well, regarding drugs, regarding violence or whatever, it's a um, simple fund. If, if they're not hard enough, with, uh, with the hands and, and what have you. It's, it's quite simple if they pull out a knife or pull out a gun and use that. And uh, believe you me, if someone pulls out a gun and, and, and fires a, a 38 in your chest, there's not much you can do about it, no matter how big you are. Things when you like, approach these guys have got their hands up, up the shirt and that way, they might be carrying a knife. You've got to be very wary. So they're not bothered about using a knife? No, I wouldn't say they're bothered at all. It's happening. With, uh, with two dealers, they're stabbing each other because they're working each other's patches and there's that much money involved that they all want to be on each other's patch. They're making thousands and thousands of pounds. It's quite easier to get rid of another dealer by stabbing them, putting them off the market so they can sell their amphetamines on their market. Would they be taking drugs themselves as well as selling them? I would say so, yes. I would say a lot of dealers take drugs. They're getting into the drug sale by taking drugs and uh, feed the habit to sell drugs. They'd walk in their pub, dead noisy, push people out the road. First thing they'd do, we'd sit at the table and mum would get the papers out, the, the joints, and they'd just start and roll a joint. It was like as if it was just like having a cigarette. Or they'd take a line of coke or ski, they'd just put on the table and snort it up their nose. Regardless who was sitting next to them, or who they were, they just didn't. And if the manager was to say, hey, there's none of that in here, then what are you going to do with it? You're one man behind the ball by yourself. What you got to do, like, is try and just fuel them. Oh, well, there's none of that. And if you let them get away with it, they do it all the time. But if you stop them, you get your ball wrecked. You'd pull the pumps off. It's a regular hand. Pumps come off dead easy. They smash them up. So you're out of beer for, the, for maybe the day till the breweries come and put your beers back on. And then what they'd do is then they'd come back in late, a like quarter of eleven on a Friday or a Saturday night when you're really busy and do it again. So that, that, that they're upsetting your trade, they're upsetting your people. So they've got to the point where everybody was fighting to come in your pub. Now why didn't the pubs and the clubs go to the police instead of going to Fifth Grand? The repercussions, the windows, the pepper bombs, um, the threat of your kids, um, little things like that. 
So how do we have, um, how do we have frightened people that was, they knew the police weren't going to be there 24 hours a day. We all know they did a good job, but they kind of be there 24 hours a day. And that's why they never went to the police. And, and a lot of publicans, once, once you start going to the police, you get regarded as a grass or whatever. And they'll call you for the rest of your life. Um, and your pub would be probably black. You get a big black mark on your pub. Or they use that as the grass's pub. If you call the police for a week before the police gets there, and the police don't do anything after that, they come and say, and he took, no, you've just missed him, they're away. That's the end of story. With Viv, it wasn't the end of story. You'd follow it up, you're going to find him the next day. That's the difference. Do you approve of a situation where people are paying out money to somebody like Viv Graham, when really one would have thought they shouldn't have to pay because they're already paying the police to do that job. Well, well, that, that's, that's, that's right, of course. Um, the problem with the Graham situation, and I do appreciate that landlords are in a difficult position at times, but if you go down that line, you are condoning violence, because these people, it's point of hiring them unless they're going to do something for you. You've got all kinds of problems there. Once, once they get connected with your business, there's a chance that the licensee are going to, they're definitely going to make enemies. Um, the people who are hurt are, are going to come back in a lot of cases. They know who's hired this man in the first place. Licensees will be threatened and have been threatened. Um, and of course, you go to the extreme end of the scale, that, that if you are, are, are hiring somebody to dish out violence, there have been many cases in Northumbria Police where people have died after just one blow in a fight. It can easily happen. And of course, I mean, that's, that's the extreme end of the scale. You're condoning extreme violence, uh, which can at times lead to death. But for a landlord faced with immediate violence, the pressure to pay for protection may be impossible to resist. And even more worrying, according to the police, is that going beyond the law for protection hasn't been confined to individual landlords. The head of Northumbria Police CID makes the startling assertion that some of the region's big brewers have themselves paid large sums of money for protection. It surprises me um, to some extent that, uh, that this is happening. But I can also understand that if it's a means of uh, ensuring that premises are managed and conducted in a, a way which is acceptable to uh, the brewers, that. Um, uh, and if the police force cannot maintain, because of lack of resources, the type of control that they would wish, that they are prepared to do this themselves. I can understand it, but I, I cannot condone it. It's a serious problem for the police if some of the best known companies in the region are paying direct to some of the region's criminals very large amounts of money, isn't it? Yes. But the police claims are firmly denied by Frank Nicholson, managing director of Bork's Breweries and chairman of the North East Brewers Association. My own brewery, certainly, so far as I'm aware, does not do so, and would in no circumstances do so. I'm pretty sure that the members of my Brewers Association, of which I'm chairman, would take the same line, so I would be very interested to hear the police evidence of that happening. But Vaux have not paid it directly? No. How about your landlords? Hmm. Let's go back to the control that we have. The one in six of the pubs that we directly manage. I'm pretty certain no. The two more out of six, i.e. The, the, the balance that we own, difficult to say, are tenants. They, they, those are tenanted pubs, let by the brewery, owned by the brewery, and let to a tenant. I don't know. I suspect that some of them may pay it. I would certainly expect if they told us that we would get involved to try to help them stop, but rarely would we be told. But you have been told on occasions. Hmm, oh yes, I'm aware by hearsay. I haven't been told by a licensee, but I've been told by people uh, who know the licensees that that happens. It's very difficult. Imagine yourself in that situation. If you were the licensee and you were questioned, have you paid protection money? Very difficult question to answer. But they're, of course, coming to you for advice. What advice would you give them? Oh, the advice I would have no hesitation in giving them, if they came to me, would be that we will get the police involved and we will support what the police are going to do. 
The brewers are meeting the police to try and find new ways of quashing the drug-related violence that afflicts northern bars. Already in Newcastle city centre, three methods of protecting the public from violence and drug dealing are operating. Video cameras watch the crowds. Rogue bouncers who actually caused violence and dealt in drugs are being weeded out. And the bars are linked by a communication system called Hubwatch. This enables landlords to alert the police and other pubs to possible trouble. Soon, Pub Watch will also be in many pubs in Wall's End, and it should eventually extend to all of Biff Graham's former territory. It's very, very important that we all stick together, and if anything does happen, to go right through with the whole thing and not be frightened and let them see they're not going to get away with it. You can't let them get away with it. Some landlords are going to find that difficult, aren't they? Because they're clearly frightened <laughs> that if they do, for example, tell the police, there will be reprisals. Yes, they are. But at the same time, who's going to live like that the rest of their life in fear? Who wants to live like that the rest of their life? I certainly don't. Whatever the benefits of pub watch, the central problem for the police is how to make inroads on organized crime when it's ruled by fear. The fear of reprisals that prevents witnesses and victims from giving evidence. In the underworld, rival gangs settle their own scores and informing is the worst crime of all. As a result, violent incidents often aren't reported to the police. Often the first they hear of a gangland shooting is from the hospitals. We interview them and they'll tell us to go away. Not in too many words, but uh, that's really what they intend us to understand. Uh, and it's very difficult because they'll not tell us who was involved, they may well know. Their intention will be to, uh, to take their own action when the opportunity arises. And even in cases where there have been fatalities, we have had great difficulty getting any person to give us support and evidence and information. They may well have known who was responsible, but uh, would want not to be seen, to be assisting the police, uh, either because it's not part of their culture to do so, or because of fear. There is something perhaps that the criminal justice system might do there uh, to support us, and that is to ensure that uh, the victims of crime and the witnesses who could assist us are given greater protection. Uh, that's need, something which needs to be worked through. If it isn't, uh, we'll have some form of anarchy on the streets uh, in the not too distant future. I mean, you fight violence with violence, it's the same as that. Um, and I've always believed that. You can't just let them take over and walk over you, you've got it. Obviously, sometimes you've got to use a little bit more, but that's the way it is.